my dad's generation, my you know that he's in his eighties now, but um, that whole generation too of what they grew up and learning. But it's about um, you know brothers. I'm talking to you out there right now. We need to see, speak up, you know, and, and and that's all part of us being that healthy and wellness, bringing that wellness out there. And I just want to introduce uh, again. This is. Gene Tagaban, I'm here with AC, and we're talking about uh, uh, Pride Month, celebrating Pride Month. We're at the Native Wellness Institute. Um, we're sponsored by the um, Seattle Indian Health Board. Program 64, number 355 here. And uh, so welcome, 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 and again. Hey, so, um, so what now? Here we are. What can we what can we look forward to as far as like moving forward and, uh, and yeah. So, um, you know, there, there's, we could talk for, for days or weeks on, um, the struggles, but I absolutely want to hold up the triumphs and the, yeah, yeah. the joys, you know, the joys, um, you know, I, I have a, a, a couple of friends, a uh, couple of guys who are married who just adopted a 12-year-old boy, hmm. something they, they couldn't have done, you know, like 15 years ago, but they've done it. And, ah, oh, they're such a beautiful family. Like, I'm, I'm going to cry here just talking about it. Um, the kid has been through so much. And to see that he has two dads that love him so much, no matter what. Is it like, that's every, like everybody should have that. I should have that. I need two dads, but that's a whole nother story. <laughs> you know? like, um, when you put your flag up, uh, you can do, you can put your flag up in places that you might not realize. You can put your flag up in the locker room when, when people are just trash talking, you know, to spirit folks or, or trash talking women you know, we don't need to be trash talking anybody. Yeah. Um, you know, you you can gently educate them, or you can absolute say, "Hey, that's not that's not how we talk here." You know, that's not happening here. Um, so, you know that that's just another way to hang that ally flag up mm -hmm. is to interrupt folks to gently educate them and. Um, you know, they, they may not be open to that education piece right now, but you're going to do it and your brothers are going to do it and more people are going to do it. And, and there's going to be a shift in that person's life. Hopefully that shift will be, you know, I, I guess I was wrong about this and, you know, they might have a, a son or a grandson that comes out as gay and they realize they've got to change their mind. Uh, or maybe that shift doesn't happen for them. And, and honestly, I feel bad for those folks because if that shift doesn't happen, <laughs> my child is knocking at the door. If that shift doesn't happen, you know, and they're carrying around that anger and hatred inside of them, um, that that's a, a poison. That's bad medicine. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And they can't, you know, they don't want to be um, carrying that, that, that makes you toxic in, inside. I'm, I'm talking about physically and spiritually that makes you toxic. Mm -hmm. So we want to educate them and we want them to, to shift in their mind. But if they can't, then the more they're hearing from you and other people, um, the better, the more likely they are to shift. And if they're not going to shift, they're going to stop that kind of locker room talk. Yeah. Yeah. They're going to stop doing it, you know, on the work site, they're going to stop behaving that way to folks like me. Yeah. Yeah. I, didn't, I never really thought about that. I mean, again, my wife and I, we have on our flagpole in front, we have a, um, this exact flag right here. It says peace out there. And, um, we never, I know, to be honest with you, I never thought about that. If some uh, a relative was being harassed or they felt threatened or stuff like that, and they, and they saw that flag, that they know that they can come up to my door. Yeah. And they can like say, hey, I can, I need help. I need a ride. Or, 
you know, and they, or, you know, just because they feel threatened or whatever it is, you know, and, and my wife and I, we would just go, yeah, yeah. Okay. What, you know? And so I never thought about that, 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 that that's actually uh, a way that, you know, people can see is like, there's a safe house. Yeah. There's a place I can go. And, you know, and I know, you know, again, as a man going into the locker room talk and I teach men male engagement, you know, and how to get men in, involved to stop the domestic violence, sexual assault, the hurt and harm against our LGBTQ relatives uh, and, uh, and themselves and, and other, you know, other men. Um, and so when I walk into a room now, people know what I stand for. And so just with my presence, the chatter and the, the talk stops, you know, because they know that, okay, here's a guy who, who you know, he won't, he, he'll call us out. He'll call us out on that. Yeah. And so, they're going to want to carry themselves in that same way with, you know, integrity and kindness and, and compassion, the more uh, yeah, that they're yeah. surrounded by it. You don't want to be the only guy doing the locker room talk and everyone giving you side eye, right? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. You know, and, and so those are just a few things that we can, you know, that can be done and uh, that our communities can do, you know. And so anything, what, what else, what other thoughts do you have that you'd like to share with uh, people out there? Um, I think there's a, a lot of ways in which we um, can be invited to thrive because as native people across the board um we're, we're applauded for our resilience because we are resilient we're still here right yeah um we're, we're here by by miracle and blessing of our ancestors and um a, a lot of reasons but but it's a miracle we are here so I, you know, I, I have a, a tagline on my email that says um, that resilience is a colonial mindset and a weaponized word that puts the onus on indigenous, indigenous people to survive the continued onslaught of barriers put in place that prevent us from thriving. I resist I want to thrive. I want my community to thrive. And so, you know, resilience is one of those words that in community, it means a lot to me. You're resilient and I'm resilient. Together we are resilient and we support the next generation and we continue. Um, but outside of our community, I think it's a pat on the head. Great job you did. Yeah. Let's see what other barrier we can throw in place, you know? <laughs> so I want the barriers brought down. I want the barriers brought down outside the Native community, but also within the community. Um, I want the lateral violence to stop. Um, I, I want us to hold up each other as sacred. And I think that um, our opinion as two-spirit people is oftentimes discounted. Yeah. And if, and if you see that happening, you know, if, if we're not at the table, find out why, you know, don't, don't let somebody tell you, well, we invited some two spirit people, but they're not coming. Why aren't they coming? Find out why go ask them. Maybe there is a very specific barrier that they said, nah, we don't want to participate. Yeah. See, that's, figure out what that is and figure out how to break down that barrier. And what can we, I, are, we are everywhere. So yeah. we should be at your meeting, right? There's so many of us. Yeah. There are in your in the communities, wherever you're at. I mean, there's our relatives who are out there, you know, yeah. and you know, and myself too, is personally is like now what 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 do I need to bring them our relatives to the, the table, bring them to the meeting, bring them into the room, and how can I make that space safe? Yes. We're gonna make that space safe. You know, what do I need to do? And um, and if they don't feel safe, why? What am I doing? And really taking a look at that. Hey, AC, I, um, I got to ask you this, though. I got to ask you this, man. Is that um, 
you know, the, the rates of suicide and, and, and self-harm is really high amongst our, our, our gay, LGBTQ, two-spirit uh, relatives, you know, and um, we just talked about resiliency, you know, and um, what can you say to those who might just be on that edge, you know, that edge might be uh, harming themselves, um, you know, or even consider in, and in their existence, you know, and what is it that that can be yeah. said to them, you know, and they might be, they might be here listening right now, or maybe a, a, a relative, auntie, uncle, mom, dad, grandma, grandpa might be listening in right now. You know, what is it that we can yeah. get told, you know, what can you share with them? Those not, yeah, those numbers are, are, are too high. You know, one, one death is, is one death too many. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I agree. Yeah. And, and I've lost friends to suicide. I lost a brother to suicide. Um, it, it's, it's painful to, to be left behind that way too. Um, but I also know it's painful to be the one considering that. Yeah. And um, man, you, you are valuable. You are loved. You are worthy. You um you're not, Ooh, you're not alone. Powerful emotions coming up here. Yeah. Um, there, you know, we can say, oh, you know, call the, the, the Trevor hotline or call this hotline or whatever. But at the point that you're considering those options, um, you're, you're feeling really alone. And if we can reach out to people and support them, before they feel that alone, um, we're going to lose fewer people. The more that we can um, learn ourselves to be accepting, the more accepted people will feel. Um, but, you know, if that's you right now, if that's what you're thinking, um, you are sacred and you belong here, and I am personally carving out space for you to be here. So please stay here and join me and help me with this work because as each one joins us, we become stronger. And that's what matters, we'll be together. You know, there's, there's, um, hey, thank you, AC, man. Thank you. Thank you so much for those words. And I hope uh, those of you who are out there um, heard that. I've had so many moments. <laughs> um, you know, where you just I, wanted I, to, I've, where you just wanted to check out and that was it, you know. But yeah, you, yeah, you yeah. Here. You know, um, I've had those moments, uh, like, where, where I, I considered maybe th this is where, where I should go with this. Like, there's no real hope for me for the future. There's mm. no real um, plan. There's no path. I can't see out of this. Um, and then I, I've had, I've had horrible moments where I, I've buried some of my children, oh. and there's no. Um, it, it, it is so upside down for a parent to bury a child right nobody wants to bury a family member period but um those moments were extended periods of time for me where it was months um that I, honestly i don't even remember those months like it comes as such a shock and it's it's another one of those really intense moments and nothing else exists but but that, cause it's so intense. Um, and I never thought I would smile again. Hmm. Um, I never thought I would feel joy again. How could I like, they took my baby boy, right? Um, he was 19 and how, how would, how could I go on? How could I literally physically take another step uh, how could I live with, without him? 
and and I'm here today, many you know many years later, um, and I'm alive, and I have I I did smile. I remember the first tiny moment of joy I felt quite a few months after my son had died. I went to the grocery store with uh, my other children, and one of my boys is. He's a prankster and a jokester. And I swear this child was born laughing. <laughs> um, and he was just being himself in the grocery store. And yeah. he said or did something. I don't remember what it was, but he said or did something that was outrageously funny. And the other kids started laughing and I started laughing. And I looked up and I noticed that I, we lived in a small town. Everybody knew that, that my son had passed away, right? And I looked up and I looked around and there was all these people looking at me and my body felt like a flood from my head all the way down, a flush of shame. How mm. could I feel joy? How dare I feel joy when my son was dead? In the midst of this grief. Yeah. And it's just, yeah, this, this is how, how grief takes over, but we can work our way through these things. And, and I did, I went home and I felt terrible. I didn't speak all the way home as I was driving. Um, but here we are, you know, years later, more than a decade later, and I have had those moments of great, great joy. But had you told me in the moment when I'm standing in the grocery store and I'm feeling intense shame that I, I had bothered to laugh, I'm not sure I would have believed you. Yeah. Um, but there was somebody by my side who went home with me. You know, somebody who was checking in with me, quite a few somebodies are checking me, you know, that the, the widow next door convinced me that she couldn't drive anymore. It wasn't true, but she needed me to drive her to the other end of the island because she had to go to the bank and blah, blah, blah. She didn't need to go to the bank. She made up this whole story because I had locked myself in my house and I wasn't going anywhere and wasn't, you know, talking to anybody. And she was rightfully concerned for my mental health and my well-being. Yeah. And uh, so she figured out a way she, she played helpless and, and, you know, sometimes like that's how we break through. And that was a breakthrough. Uh, I nearly crashed her new car, but um, <laughs> uh, you know, we, we, it, it was a matter of, I went to shift and it, and it wasn't that kind of vehicle. And so I hit the brake thinking I was hitting the clutch and I was like, Oh Jesus. <laughs> and we came to, you know, a screeching halt on the freeway, which you don't want to do, but um you know, it took months for me to get beyond that. Yeah. It, it's not a magic moment where, oh, wow, I laughed. Now I feel better. We're moving forward. No, it took years. Yeah. It took years of good medicine and a lot of hard work on my part. And that good medicine takes time. That's, you know, I was out in, in for me, it was out being in the woods and hiking and, and being with other people who could, um, experience joy and it was okay with them that I wasn't laughing and smiling for a while. Mm -hmm. And eventually I was able to, without feeling such pain and shame, um, they were there for me. We've got a surround community. We've got to be there for people. Um, and it's hard if we don't know that they're suffering, but we should always ask, keep asking, what are your struggles? What can I help you with? Just checking in with them. Yeah. Just checking in with them. You know, it's like you said, we're all good. We're, we're good medicine. You know, and uh, um, Robert Johnston, who's with the Native Wellness Institute, we, he always talks about, too, is that we're mm -hmm. all, we are all walking um, medicine pouches. Yeah. We're all walking, living, breathing medicine pouches. Medicine. We are medicine. You know, in our LGBTQ community, our relatives, uh, two-spirit relatives, um, I just want, I want to say, too, is that you are medicine. You are medicine, you know, for the soul, for the spirit, for this world, for this world. You know, and even though you might be on the edge, whatever it is, just you are medicine. And like uh, AC was talking about, it's like, you know, it's okay. You'll break through it. I mean, just like you had that breakthrough. 